oftentimes, probably more often than not, although it might be more often than not, but oftentimes <laughs> I feel like we humans are in a tricky situation that we probably won't solve when it comes to like the ecological situation we find ourselves in. But let's not go there. Let's see if we can forge a path towards adequate solutions that will actually solve the ecological situation we find ourselves in today. So one problem with our comprehension of our ecological situation is the information dump mode that most sources of information adopt to try and convince their audience that this is an important issue that needs to be solved. Okay, obviously on the face of it, this is an important issue and it needs to be solved. But what I'm trying to say is the means by which these sources of information disseminate their information, how they engage in what Timothy Morton calls information dump mode and what we might call ecological information dump mode. This is beyond useless and is actually foolish in many cases because it inspires a form of action that is foolish and that won't help solve the problem of humanity at a collective level undermining the ecological substrate upon which we depend okay so examples of such foolish responses are the just stop oil movement and the extinction rebellion movement both clearly have an honourable impulse to stop the degradation of the ecological substrate upon which we depend. But the solution set that they offer and the behaviours that they subsequently engage in as a result of their comprehending the situation in that foolish way, that solution set is foolish because it won't help solve the situation. For one thing, most people find the behaviours that these individuals who subscribe to these movements, most people find their behaviours unattractive, unappealing, um, ab abhorrent in some cases, such as when they block roads and stop people, normal people, from getting to work. That's just, that's just wrong. So let me give you fair warning, <laughs> I'm about to engage in ecological information dump mode, not for the purposes that most sources of information do it. Purposes that I actually don't quite understand, <laughs> to be honest. But for the purpose of showing how this mode of information dissemination is useless. So, in these graphs, we can see that for the most part, it is business sectors and industries who contribute to CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions disproportionately. But when this information is presented to people, it's usually directed at the individual. There's an implication that you, as the individual, are guilty. And it incorrectly attributes blame to the in individual when it should be correctly attributing blame to the industries and business sectors that disproportionately contribute to these concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So this form of ecological information dump mode induces one of two broadly categorized thematic responses within and between which there will be many variations but for the purposes of this piece let's just consider these two broad broadly categorized responses. The first we might call the environmental response and curiously enough this maps almost perfectly onto the American political divide, that schema, but let's not go there just yet. Let's try and have a scientific uh, discourse that will itself inform political discourse as opposed to the other way around. So we have the environmental response, 
what this looks like is hobbling oneself uh, for the sake of some greater good. In other words, you as the environmentalist who elect to go down this environmental response pathway, you say to yourself, okay, fossil fuels are the major problem here, and so I'm going to reject anything that has to do with fossil fuels. I'm not going to use a car to transport, nor am I going to fly, nor am I going to buy food from the supermarket because I understand that the supply chain that got that food there is dependent on fossil fuels. Taken to its extreme, it looks like you becoming a hermit and living in a place as far away from civilization as is possible, subsisting off the land and hunting to the extent that you can. That's what the environmental response looks like. The second broadly ca categorized thematic response is, let's call it the non-environmental response. This looks like insisting upon business as usual because you understand that you don't want to hobble yourself for the sake of this greater good, this ill-defined greater good. And so you choose not to go down that environmental pathway, but instead this non-environmental pathway. You insist upon business as usual and wherever the environmental negative externalities of your actions are so blatantly obvious that they can't be ignored, <laughs> you simply incorporate the latest technological innovation to address that symptomatic that symptom, say. So we've got those two responses. The one is unproductive. When you become a hermit, you lose all influence that you otherwise may have had on steering the course of humanity away from the self-terminating trajectory that you correctly identified. The other is actually counterproductive because if you continue to emit your negligible contribution to the greenhouse gas emissions, then scaling that up to the collective level, that is actually what where the problem lies in terms of humanities collectively undermining the ecological substrate upon which we depend. So we find ourselves in a tricky situation here, stuck between a rock and a hard place. Our society, modern society, depends upon fossil fuels. We have built infrastructure that depends upon fossil fuels that allow our society to continue functioning the way it does. We can't simply just sop oil. We depend heavily upon oil to continue living the way we live. So what do we do about this? Here's what we might be able to do about this, such that the solution set proposed and implemented doesn't negatively affect the quality of human life. We have to understand that for every solution we provide, there are trade-offs inherent in those solutions. So for example, okay, here's an example. The extent to which a nation emits greenhouse gases is positively correlated with GDP per capita. In other words, the more your nation emits greenhouse gases, the richer you as an individual who live within that nation are. So there's a, a relationship between greenhouse gas emissions and quality of life. For an adequate solution set to be proposed and implemented. We want to understand the trade-off relationships between the likes of greenhouse gas emissions and quality of human life. And we want to almost separate this quality of human life from greenhouse gas emissions. When it comes to GDP and greenhouse gas emissions, we want to try and decouple these two aspects of our situation. So. Instead of it being GDP, let's just call it quality of life. We want quality of life to increase while at the same time greenhouse gas, greenhouse gas emissions decrease. So we want there to be an inverse relationship as opposed to a positively correlated relationship. How we go about doing that, 
I have yet to figure out. <laughs> but it's these sorts of concepts that we need to more deeply understand in order to more deeply understand the problem set we have before us. Which would then subsequently allow us to propose solution sets that are adequate for solving this problem without causing a reduction in human quality of life. So I think this ecological situation demands the best of each of us as individuals. Because if we don't step up to this challenge, then I fear we're not going to solve it. And that, that's where we, we get back to the start of the video <laughs> where I mentioned that. But that's it. We need to figure out how to become mature adults in this world. Because right now, most chronological adults behave as though they're psychologically still children. They ignore the negative consequences of their actions because of the short-term gain that they experience. But that short-term gain comes at the cost of future generations and long-term sustainability. So somehow we have to really figure out this problem set if we are to provide adequate solution sets. And yet this comes back to the obligation on you as the individual to step up and consider this behemoth task for what it is a major challenge that you can actually use to guide your life and help realize the potential that you know is within so even that that's not spoken to in most environmental ecological circles the relationship between the individual and the collective ecological situation we find ourselves in Unless we as individuals can become mature adults in this hypernovel, strange world. I don't think we're going to solve this problem. So we each take it upon ourselves as individuals to become that mature adult in hypernovel modernity. And then eventually we will meet each other and begin discussing, dialoguing, not necessarily debating. <laughs> Because debate has winners and losers and I think if you're a mature adult you understand that we're all in this together. We have a shared fate. We can come together, have those discussions and then actually propose adequately comprehensive solution sets to this behemoth task, complex problem set that we have before us. <laughs> Obviously, just like the times we live in, that sort of a mature adult human is unprecedented and yep, it's a behemoth task to try and become that human but hey, what else are we going to do? <laughs>